jewel to light the day, a star to shine at night. It is my pleasure to welcome the jewel and the star of this morning's Sunday service and to deliver the message to you this morning, Mrs. Carol Campbell. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, I like I, I like this introduction. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to all of you for joining me here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. And to those of you joining me on the World Wide Web, welcome. This is Sunday, November the 23rd. Next month is December. And we know what that means. <laughs> Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. That's from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verse 19, in the King James Version. At this point, Peter and John had recently returned to Jerusalem following Jesus' ascension and had performed their own miraculous healing, drawing the ire of some and the awe of others. Now this is new for the New Testament, even though the Old Testament is full of references to repentance and forgiveness of sin. You know, I was in half a tree one day, and this lady came along, repent, 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 Jesus is coming. And I mean, I thought, whoa, whatever it is you're selling, I'm not interested. <laughs> The Wikipedia definition of repentance is, and I quote, the activity of reviewing one's actions and feeling contrition or regret for past wrongs. It generally involves a commitment to personal change and to live a more responsible and humane life. Now, both John the Baptist and Jesus advised us in Matthew chapters 3 and 4, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The online Bible dictionary says, to repent is to turn from sin and turn to God, and therein lies the key to salvation and forgiveness from God. So what does science of mind teach? According to the metaphysical Bible, the Greek word, sorry, the metaphysical Bible dictionary, the Greek word metanoia translated is repentance, which literally means change your mind. A proper translation of the mission of John the Baptist is that of immersion in a transformed mind. Baptism means to immerse in an element to a complete saturation. That's the end of the quote. Now this would suggest a change not merely of conduct, but of thinking. Now the Latin root, penitere, means to think, from which is derived the word penitence. Thus, many Christian teachings have taken that to mean contrition, sorrow, and deep regret that must be necessary for repentance. But it quite literally means to think again, to think a new thought. Bob Proctor, an inspirational coach, says, and I quote, if you don't consciously and deliberately create order in your mind, your environment or the people around you will dictate your mental state of being. So I've titled my talk this morning, What's Stopping You? Last week, the Edna Manley College for the Visual and Performing Arts, where I lecture, held its graduation ceremony. And the guest speaker was an absolutely brilliant communicator, Mr. Ramu Damodaran from the United Nations Public Outreach Division. He came up with an acronym for EMCVPA, the first letters of the name of the college, which says, enlightened minds create venues of possibility and accomplishment. I thought this man is a genius. <laughs> enlightened minds create venues of possibility and accomplishment. He managed to sum up in eight words the mission of the college, an intensely creative space comprised of five schools that mold creative minds and spirit. Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of this teaching called The Science of Mind, and author of the textbook of the same name said, a trained mind 
is much more powerful than an untrained mind. So what can we do with our minds? What good is it to us, really? Can we use it to move us from idea to experience, from desire to manifestation, from dream to expression? Well, of course we can. We hear this message in one form or another every week, and we say we believe it. So how come we don't always get the desired results? Most often it's sometimes coffee, sometimes tea. Every January, for instance, coming up again soon, we go through a goal setting exercise here with every good intention. And we expect that our trained minds will find a way to bring the desire to fruition. If we plan properly, pray rightly, visualize and strategize with vision boards, etc., etc. Well, we all know that a few months down the road, many of the goals get lost in the shuffle. Some are forgotten, others are rationalized away as not the right time, not the right desire, and a host of other excuses. But suppose I were to tell you that goal setting is a waste of time without deliberate, focused action toward the specific goal. Many of us have the desire, but haven't a clue how to get to it. So we put it on the top shelf for later, or we throw it out altogether. Well, the dream without the drive is just wishful thinking, or more precisely, wistful thinking. When we feel a desire to have us something more, something better, that's a call to realize, as in to make real, our highest potential. Moving into the creative possibility is where the creative process happens. Not in wishing and hoping, planning and scheming, like the pop song of the 60s said. That won't get you into his arms, cause if you're dreaming about what true love is, all you gotta do is hold him and squeeze him and kiss him and show him that you care. Hmm. So what's a girl to do? <laughs> In other words, action does it. I want to share a little story I read recently on the internet. There was a young man who moved to the desert and decided he wanted a nice green lawn. So he went out and bought several gallons of green paint. He then painted the dirt in front of his house bright green. When asked why, he replied, because everybody knows you can't grow grass in the desert. Hmm. His neighbors laughed behind closed doors as every few months, the man painted his dirt again to brighten his lawn. Each time someone would ask why he did it, he would say, because everyone knows you can't grow grass in the desert. Finally, one neighbor took pity on him. He pulled him aside and asked, what's the number one sport in Las Vegas? The man thought for a moment, golf. And where is Las Vegas? In the desert. Hmm. Then why haven't you planted grass? Because you can't grow. The young man paused. Grass in the desert? Hmm. Buddha has said, the mind that perceives the limitation is the limitation. Friends, we are unlimited beings. We exist in a field of pure potentiality. We are possibility powerhouses. But what do we do with that when we're up the proverbial creek without a paddle? Or have alligators chasing us around the swamp? The alligators could look like job loss, failed relationship, empty bank account, illness, etc., etc. We live our lives by a set of beliefs that have developed over time. And these beliefs define our worlds and quite often limit our expression. Suppose we could see the apparent setback as an opportunity instead. Steve Golding, our own Steve, shared the other day some words of wisdom from his niece, which says, every setback is a setup for a comeback. <laughs> Brilliant. Every setup, every setback is a setup for a comeback. If we're feeling sick, for instance, and recognize that on the other side of that door we have labeled illness is vibrant health trying to come through, wouldn't it speed our recovery 
if we then focused on health rather than illness? We could ask ourselves, why do I want to be healthy? And then answer the question with some new positive ideas about what health means to you. The same goes for any other desire. Why do you want it? What are you going to do with it when you get it? What good is it to you anyway? Set up the recovery, the manifestation, with clear, focused attention to your intention. And that doesn't mean you have to figure everything out down to the last detail. The ego craves details. But uncertainty is the starting point of creation. We enter the field of possibility as a co-creator in partnership with divine intelligence. Be creative from a place of childlike receptivity and playfulness without the desperation of ego demands and know with calm, clear confidence that the desire is already fulfilled. Claire Zamet, a wonderful, beautiful life coach says, an acorn doesn't need a goal or a plan of action to become a mighty oak. What it needs is fertile soil and the right conditions to nurture its nature, end quote. We plant ourselves in fertile soil when we enter into a state of consciousness that recognizes the generosity of life, the ever-givingness of spirit, and know that what is fayo can be unfayo. Life offers itself to us, and the more we see the manifestation of our desires unfolding before us, the more receptive we are, and the more we simply say thank you, the more there is to be thankful for. In this state of consciousness, we unlock that door that separates us from our desires. As Meister Eckhart Tolle says, and I quote, say yes to life and see how suddenly life starts working for you rather than against you. We must let go of fear and step into a new paradigm that connects us with our deeper truth, that of knowing that whatever is our deepest desire, the subconscious mind in partnership with universal law will create infinite ways to manifest that dream. But we have to show up willing to give up our personal stories of limitation and create a shift in consciousness that is centered in truth and open to possibilities. Our old stories of limitation will hold us back. You do know what those stories are, don't you? I'm too old for a relationship. I'm too inexperienced for that dream job. I'm not a good money manager. I'm not creative enough. I'm too fat, too thin, too short, too tall, whatever. Let's get real. Don't be your own biggest obstacle. We're here to manifest greatness, to demonstrate the presence of an unfathomable, infinite, indwelling presence as vitality, prosperity, wholeness, love, joy, peace, light, creativity. But nothing is going to change until we change and create a new pattern. You think the caterpillar knows how to become a butterfly? Probably not. It knows very well how to be a caterpillar. But until the transformation takes place, it matters not how great a caterpillar it is, how much it has accomplished, or how hard it tries to be a butterfly. It's still a caterpillar. I have a little affirmation for you. I'll say it first, and then you can say it with me. I am a powerful creative force, and I have what it takes to create the life of my dreams. I take control of my future now. I'll say it line by line. I am a powerful creative force. I am a powerful creative force. And I have what it takes to create the life of my dreams. I take control of my future now. I take control of my future now. 
It was Abe Lincoln, President of the United States, who said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Rethink your position, release old limiting ideas, and lay hold of faith. Plant seeds of change that are firmly established in the fertile soil of an enlightened consciousness and get ready for a harvest of limitless possibilities. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's stopping you? Namaste. <laughs>